Good evening, my name is Shin Yi Pai and I'm Program Director at Town Hall. On behalf of the staff at Town Hall Seattle and the Henry M. Jackson Foundation and our friends at Third Place Books, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our presentation with the Honorable Jeffrey S. Sutton and Senator Joe Wynn. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. We're so glad to have you join us tonight. The presentation will run about 60 minutes, including Q&A. To submit your questions for the Q&A portion of the event, please enter meet.ps backslash Sutton or scan the QR code right now on the screen with your smartphone. We'll drop this link in the chat and remind folks where to go when we get to Q&A. We can't guarantee that we'll be able to address every question, but we will try to get as to as many as possible. You can help us by keeping your own question concise. For those who would like to view the program with closed captions, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. Town Hall is adding new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming events include the next installment of our In the Moment podcast featuring David Bosco and correspondent Steve Scher in discussion on the struggle to govern the world's oceans, and Elsa Jennison and Meg Ellison on the deaf-blind experience and the fight to end ableism. Visit our website to join our email list and get the latest updates as more programs are added throughout the season. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our civic series is supported by Real Networks Foundations and True Brown Foundation. Town Hall is also a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of the members who are joining us. If you share Town Hall's vision of a community strengthened by discussions about civic science and culture where everyone has a voice, please consider supporting us by donating or becoming a member. Lastly, you'll absolutely want to dig into tonight's topic by purchasing your own copy of the author's book. Please use the link in the chat below to pick up your copy through Third Place Books. The Honorable Jeffrey S. Sutton serves on the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. Judge Sutton was a partner with the law firm of Jones Day and served as state solicitor of the state of Ohio. He also served as a law clerk to the Honorable Lewis F. Powell, Jr., the Honorable Antonine Scalia, and the Honorable Thomas J. Meskel. In addition to who decides states as, labor as laboratories of constitutional experimentation, he is the author of 51 Imperfect Solutions. Senator Joe Wynn was born in White Center, raised in Berrien, and currently lives in West Seattle. His experiences growing up in an immigrant community as the son of Vietnamese refugees and raised by a single mother inform much of his service today. Senator Wynn is the Vice Chair of the Senate Human Services Reentry and Rehab Rehabilitation Committee, Committee and a member of the Transportation Committee, the Rules Committee, and the Environment, Energy, and Technology Committee. Sutton's new book, Who Decides, States as Laboratories of Constitutional Experimentation, is the subject of this evening's talk. Please join me in welcoming Judge Sutton and Senator Wynn. Perfect. Thank you so much. And, and candidly, I'm pretty excited about this conversation as a state legislator because I have to grapple with these delineations often with state and federal law. And, and the number of times that my staff has to come back and say, hey, this might not pass muster, not just with the, with the state constitution, but with the U.S. constitution is pretty high. So I'm glad to have the expert here with me today to, to have this discussion. Well, Senator, it's, it's wonderful to be here, and I'm not sure I'm the expert, but I'm glad to be talking <laughs> with you. <laughs> no, well, here, we'll just jump right in. And, and for the audience as well, I'd like to frame up this discussion a little bit to kind of get a sense of the implications of who decides or who gets to decide uh, based off of your book, obviously, and how this could impact their daily lives. So can you give some examples of the times where states have differed from the federal constitution or federal laws and kind of how that might impact them on a regular basis? Yeah, you know, we, we live in a, a world where um, I guess I would call it a peril of a single story where we think our rights are protected primarily by the U.S. Supreme Court and the U.S. Constitution. And I think we forget that each of each state has its own constitution. Washington has its uh, muscular constitution that guarantees all kinds of rights. And, you know, I, I think one thing that we're so focused on these days is the U.S. Supreme Court and its epic battles about this right or that right. And one of the things that's really important about state constitutions is, you know, if, if you lose a case at the U.S. Supreme Court or a case at the U.S. Supreme Court comes out in a way that perhaps makes you unhappy, you know, maybe you wish they protected a right that you care deeply about, the genius of American federalism is that's not the end of the story. Uh, you're, you're allowed to go to the Washington state courts. Uh, 
You're allowed to invoke the Washington Constitution, which has a rigorous Bill of Rights in Article One, and seek protection there. And quite often, the guarantees in the state constitution are more muscular than the guarantees in the federal one. Um, I can give you one or two examples. Um, so the state of Washington has been pretty careful about um, basically ending capital punishment under the Washington Constitution. So that, that's, you know, that's a Washington Constitution protection that doesn't apply to other states. It fills a gap uh, left by the US Constitution, at least for those who oppose capital punishment because the US Supreme Court has not outlawed capital punishment. So that's a really good example. The US Supreme Court has kind of had a hands-off view of capital punishment, at least in terms of ending it completely. They've decided that's for state courts or state legislatures or Congress. And here you have a situation in Washington where your state Supreme Court has done that very thing. Um, yeah. I think Washington also had some school funding litigation. Um, yeah. That's another good example where at the federal level, um, the US Supreme Court has been hesitant to establish a constitutional baseline of equity between wealthier and poor or middle of the road school districts. And a lot of state courts, I think including the Washington Supreme Court have been pretty muscular in interpreting the Washington constitution to establish more equity between and among school districts within the state. No, those are great examples. And I think one of the things that we've kind of been grappling with also is the legalization of cannabis and the conversations happening there versus kind of what's happening in Washington state as well. That's, you know, that's such a great illustration because the U.S. Supreme Court about 10 years ago in a case called Rach said um, the Congress is allowed to regulate this throughout the country. Um, back then and today, to this day, federal law prohibits, you know, selling yeah. cannabis or for that matter, possessing it. Now, the attorney general for the last couple of administrations has not been enforcing that law, basically allowing this laboratories of experimentation to unfold in the states. And so you've got some states are dipping their toes into it with medical use of marijuana. Others are um, liberating it entirely from any prohibitions. And what a great you know, experiment that's you know, going on. We, we may find out in 15 years that uh, this is great for all purposes. We may find it's very good for medical purposes. Yeah. We may find a few warts along the way. And, um, you know, that's the way federalism is supposed to work. Yeah, no, and, and we certainly had some of those bumps as well. And you kind of brought it up a second ago. And this is a concept that you brought up in your first book, 51 Imperfect Solutions. But the perspective that most American law is kind of one sided and takes, you know, the focus of the US Constitution, rather than considering the fact that we have 50 other constitutions to be able to consider as well um that like i knew that you know inherently but i never thought about it from that perspective as well like i never questioned why that was actually a bad thing can you talk more about why that might not be the best route in which we go yeah well i think if i had one concern today is that maybe we americans are asking a little much of the u.s supreme court when it comes to defining and enforcing new constitutional rights that, you know, maybe we're putting all of our eggs in one basket when we would do better to share the load of, you know, new rights innovation. One way to think about it is to compare your job as a state legislator to Congress. You know, Justice Brandeis had this great insight, you know, about a hundred years ago that when you have a difficult social problem, you shouldn't nationalize one answer at the outset. You should let a brave state try one approach, a bra another brave state try another approach. If a winning insight emerges over time, then Congress can nationalize the winning insight. And sometimes though, Brandeis acknowledged that maybe the people of Washington are gonna do something a little different through their legislature than say the people in my state, Ohio. Yeah. So with, with legislation, we do it from the ground up. But when it comes to constitutional rights, we've kind of inverted it. And so it's race to Washington, winner take all, top down, you know, state courts can maybe fill gaps left by the US Supreme Court. What I prefer to see is the same Brandeis experimentation model where state courts, the Washington Supreme Court become the 
first responders, the experimenters in chief, other states can look at that trial and error. And if something really useful emerges, why let the US Supreme Court nationalize it? Um, otherwise, you know, let one state try one thing and another state try the other. Um, yeah, it's a benefit to have multiple perspectives on a particular issue, especially given the fact that there's uncertainty in issues as well. You know, I, I think that's right. I also think maybe the U.S. Supreme Court's been the victim of its own success. I mean, if you were to ask yourself, you know, what's the one case every American knows, it would probably be Brown versus Board of Education, where or the court Brown correctly brought Jim Crow to heel, ended yeah. segregation in the South. And I think the success of that story has sometimes led us to think, oh, the court can fix everything or the court, you know, the court's always right. Now that that's a myth too. I mean, I'm a federal judge. I can promise you we make mistakes and it's very dangerous to put all your, your faith in one branch of government. You'll eventually be disappointed. <laughs> I think... As a legislator, I think you can be disappointed is a very apt uh, description. <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, so, so you talk more about how we should be less focused on, say, the federal government. But, and you touched upon it again, is kind of in what instances do you think there are issues that are ripe for federal level decision, whether it's law or the Supreme Court? Well, you know, you know a, a nice, this is a little bit controversial, but I think it's on everybody's mind. So I might as well talk about it. I think the pandemic illustrates um, how American federalism really ought to work. I think there's some parts of the pandemic where we can just all agree the national government just has a key role. Yeah. And then there are other parts of it where, you know, maybe it's, it's good to have a little trial and error. So an example is something I think we would all agree in retrospect was a good idea for the national government under, you know, the last two administrations to take the lead and, financing, buying, developing vaccination, right? I mean, you couldn't rely on the state of Washington to do that. I mean, that, that's, that's a very good job for the national government to take the lead in vaccination, be monitoring, testing, and when you find something that works, get it out as fast as possible. So that, that's a great example of, you know, kind of the national backstop in action, and we should be grateful for this national government. But now we, we shift to things that get so complicated. I mean, just think of in schooling, stay at home versus mass versus virtual. It's just, it's just, I mean, you really have to be an incredibly sophisticated person to be able to tell someone I have just one answer to this. And yeah. I think, you know, I'm sure many people listening have very strong views about the right answer here, but the fact that different parts of the country are trying different approaches is ultimately quite useful. I mean, it, you know, it shows that Brandeis's metaphor isn't really a metaphor at all. I mean, we really are, do have a laboratory as we're seeing what's happening in Florida, what happens in Texas, what happens in Washington, Massachusetts. You know, it's not as if elected officials don't want to protect the people, right? I mean, if, if they see a story, a success story, they're going to follow the success stories. So, I, I feel like uh, the pandemic, which is just so complicated and, and so brutal and ruthless in so many ways, it just illustrates both components that, you know, when you get a winning insight, we got to nationalize it right away Yeah. and tell them we're kind of, you know, feeling our way in the dark and it's nice to have different options out there. Yeah, well, kind of not just the winning insights, but also what happens when things go wrong. And it's like, oh, maybe we should not do that. And in yes. fact, it go towards this direction instead. So it's both. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know, people, this is not to take a cheap shot because God only knows if I'd been in charge, all the mistakes I would have made. But, you know, think of someone early on dealing with, um, you know, a lack of hospital beds and the idea of, well, we'll put people in nursing homes where they're skilled nursing, right? That, that it wouldn't have been crazy at first because they're skilled nursing in a nursing home. But then of course, we now know the elderly are the most vulnerable. So, you know, not a good idea, but yeah. not, you know, that's only because we saw what happened as opposed to knowing it from the outset. So it works both ways, right? A winning insight and then some things that it's best we don't repeat. Yeah, here, and we'll change gears a little bit. And kind of in your book, you talk about the role of a judge, right? And the role of a judge is somewhat similar to that of an umpire. And you even quote Justice Roberts in saying that, like an umpire, they should play a modest role because nobody goes to a game to see the umpire. 
Uh, but given the discourse that we're seeing in the Supreme Court right now, I couldn't help but chuckle a little bit because there is a little bit of tension associated with that role. Um, and you brought it up because you wanted to bring up the perils of what's happening, what's what could happen in a role like that, where a litigant brings you know to the, to the Supreme Court a decision that is new. So can you talk more about kind of the role of a judge as an umpire versus what might be happening now? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I really embrace what Chief Justice Roberts was saying. I do think the analogy is good in lots of ways that we are supposed to call balls and strikes. We are supposed to interpret the law. We don't take sides. We're not supporting one team or the other. I think the complication is when we have these constitutional challenges, once the, once the courts decide that a matter that you know people care a lot about is covered by the constitution, now we are part of the game, right? Because we're now in charge of what that provision means. So you really can't say at that point, we're disinterested because we're, we would be the ones that announce the decision. We're going to be the ones to interpret the decision. And so I think what it shows is it's very hard for federal judges to stay completely out of politics, completely out of people's perceptions of politics, because of course, these debates are about things Americans care a lot about, right? Yeah. I and mean, just think of, you know, the, whether it's guns, abortion, marriage, capital punishment, um, equity in schools, criminal procedure, Americans care a lot about that. And so that's what has me worried. I think the second thing that has me worried is these confirmation battles. Mm -hmm. Increasingly, the votes for nominees to the Supreme Court and the lower federal courts are nearly 100% along partisan lines. So in other words, if it's a Democratic nominee, the Democratic senators will support, the Republican senators will oppose, and then vice versa. And yeah, that's unless, unfortunate. You're Joe, unless you're Joe Manchin, but unless you're Joe Manchin. <laughs> that's unfortunate for judges, though, because it makes it look like we have blue robes and red robes. And we, yeah. we because we don't, we don't, we don't sympathize with one political party. We don't have an agenda. We do have different philosophies of interpretation. And so that, that, that's real. That's, but I, I do think the problem is very, you know, really, really serious. And I think it goes back to maybe we're just asking too much of the U S Supreme court to protect individual liberty. And maybe we ought to rely a little more on state courts, state legislatures, you <laughs> to protect rights and, it doesn't have to be in the courts exclusively, uh, but if it is in the courts, um, let's not forget about our state courts and state constitutions, which, you know, think about it this way. People may not realizing, realize it, but everybody listening believes in state constitutions, I promise you, because, you know, what else are you going to do? If the U.S. Supreme Court puts up a big stop sign when it comes to your favorite right or something you really care about, I mean, you just have two options. I mean, one is to embrace unhappiness, which gets old after a while, or you go to state court and seek protection under the state constitution or the state legislature or something local. Um, yeah. you, know, you have no other option if the US Supreme Court says no. Well, then like they'd have to prioritize your issue so they may not even address it even if it is an important one. And then no, I mean, yeah, I mean, that it's, it's possible the U.S. Supreme Court might say we're just staying out of this. It's not for the federal courts to hear. So they might not even favor one side or the other. They might just say the Constitution doesn't speak to it. But the key is that at that point, if you really care about something as a matter of public policy, you just, there's nothing else to do but go local. Go to, go to your city, go to your state legislature, go to your state court, and if be amend your state constitution. Yeah, and that's actually a good segue to the next question is then who gets to govern, right? Like the maps in which defines legislative districts. So we have a unique situation happening in Washington state right now where uh, for, for a good reason, 40 years ago, we tried to move away from the overt gerrymandering and we have a redistricting commission where it's two Democrats and two Republicans draw the maps and then they have to get three out of the four to vote to agree that these maps go forward. Um, what ends up happening, which doesn't happen very often, is that if there is no agreement, then that decision, the drawing of the maps, then goes to our courts. Uh, so lo and behold, <laughs> this actually happened last week where uh, we were not able to come to a compromise uh, 
on these maps. And our Supreme Court now has the next few months in order to figure that out. Um, and you actually made a statement in your book that said, uh, or actually, I think it's a quote from uh, Justice Ginsburg that judicial review, or I said, you said this, judicial review uh, in its most extreme form may be the greatest form of gerrymandering ever known, right? <laughs> and, and, and I was, you know, I, like I read that given the context that we're in right now, and I'm like, ooh, that's interesting because that's exactly what's going to happen in Washington state. So can you talk more about, you know, not just gerrymandering, but the roles of the courts and how do we, you know, potentially navigate these waters in Washington state over the next few months? Yeah, so there's there's so much there uh, in this question, and it's such a this, this problem is going on throughout the country. So so first first of all, maybe some easy things. I think we would all agree that um, at least extreme partisan gerrymandering has not been good for the country. In other words, put to the side whether it's a Republican dominated legislature, Democrat, you know, it's just not good because um, what it means is that the elections that really matter are the primaries. And if the only elections that matter are the primaries, it leads people to go to the extremes. So the Republican would go more conservative, the Democrat a little more liberal. And so it's just not been good for our civic discourse. That's thing number one. Thing number two, my analogy to the courts is we all agree that's terrible. And I just found myself saying, well, if we agree that's so terrible, why do we want five members of a life tenured court to make all of our decisions for us? We should think that's the worst form of gerrymandering ever. So that was my Second yeah. thing, which I think we should at least think a little bit about before we go to Washington to resolve every matter through some provision in the US Constitution. Now to the problem that you're facing, um, it's hard. You're not the only state with this. Ohio's got, is going through the same thing right now. And I, I don't know quite where they are, but they have a similar procedure where if you can't get the right form of compromise, it goes to the courts. Well. Let me just say, I'm not, <laughs> when it comes to who decides the maps in Washington or anywhere, my first priority is not judges. Uh, not because I don't, <laughs> yeah. not, not because I don't like judges, not because I don't trust judges, but I just feel it's a little bit like taking some folks that are not athletes and asking them to play baseball. You're, you're not going to get a very good baseball game because that's just not their expertise. Yeah. Now, but the, the thing with who decides is you do have stalemates and you do have to have a map. I mean, you have, a, uh, you have elections that will come next fall or, well, you have primaries, right? You have primaries. When are your primaries? In August, next August. Yeah. So you have to have something in place for, you know, the primary and, you know, better the state courts than the federal courts. I will say that. I because, do agree there. <laughs> because <laughs> at least they're judges who are accountable to the citizens of Washington, uh, that seems to me helpful. But we do get pulled into these as well. We don't get pulled in necessarily to redraw them, but we get pulled into disputes about the Voting Rights Act and particularly whether um, the map drawing is racially motivated, either hurting minority groups or overly favoring them in a way that actually hurts one political party or the other. Those are the two types of claims we get. So I feel your pain um, when it comes to <laughs> the, the solution. I, I don't, you know, I, I will say one other thing about, you know, what would you think of the option of not letting it go to the courts? So what you could do there is you could say either people compromise or the party in charge keeps gerrymandering, right? That's the thing you guys are trying to avoid. Yeah, yeah. And, and the only thing, the only thing that maybe isn't terrible about that is eventually all political parties overreach. Um, you know, and when there, there's always a time of reckoning when there's overreaching. It may take longer than you think, but that would be the only thing I might say if if you chose not to give it to the state courts to draw the maps. The other possibility is let the party in charge overreach and let the people say this is outrageous and eventually yeah. punish them. Well, and uh, I think there's one of the questions from the chat from the audience is, is Washington's new mapping techniques favored by other states? And I don't know if this is actually uh, used by many other jurisdictions and will gerrymandering ever cease? And I think the, the crux of that question really is, depends on what you think is good or bad. What is the universal equality, right? And and you kind of pointed out the 1965 uh, Voting Rights Act. That was actually one of the points of contention of why we couldn't get agreement is because 
there's an area called the Yakima Valley, which is a majority Latino community that needed to comply with the Voting Rights Act. Um, so it, you had a whole chapter on why it's important to get representation. Uh, and I'm sorry, I'm kind of like, you know, divesting from the question a little bit, but the states really have led the way before these amendments at the federal level happened, before the Voting Rights Act, whether it's Vermont and Kentucky helping eliminate property requirements, New York paving the way for minority votes and, and whatnot as well. So how do we find that balance? So how do we create fair representation where we can achieve, you know, universal universal equality, I guess, as you as Yeah, about. Well, well, the questioner, you know, in asking whether it's ever going to go away, I have to say I'm a little um, pessimistic, not um, because I don't trust state judges, state legislators. It's because it's been with us from all, from the beginning. I mean, the term gerrymandering comes from one of the founders, a guy from Massachusetts named Elbridge Gerry. Uh, so he gerrymandering with us at the founding. And this actually shows the law of unintended consequences. One of the things I'd be curious, Senator, your take on it, um, you know, for a long time in American history, state legislators did not have to redraw their maps every 10 years. Yeah, that's a that's a rule that comes out of a U.S. Supreme Court decision called Reynolds versus Sims, the one person, one vote idea. And one person, one vote has got a lot of benefits to it, but I'm not sure it was necessarily a good idea to require new maps every 10 years, because what that did is it it required every 10 years an opportunity to gerrymander. Yeah. I suspect I suspect a lot of states, including Washington, might have been fine with saying, hey, let's let this go another 10 years. Um, you know, this, there's nothing outrageous about it. There's nothing, there's no group, there's no minority group that's being unfairly treated. Let's le let sleeping dogs lie. That used to be the rule until this one person, one vote. So the point I'm getting at is sometimes you constitutionalize something at the national level, it creates these collateral effects. Now back to the is there any way out of this? Um, <laughs> I do like the idea. I do like your, the heart of your idea is the same idea Ohio has used, which is you have to have a compromise. In other words, you have to get buy-in by each political party. Yeah, that, that, that makes so much sense as a way of getting the extreme parts of gerrymandering to the sides. But I, you know, it's difficult. And the, you know, the Voting Rights Act is really complicated because you could take a legislature that is, claims it's really protecting this group, but is actually doing it for sometimes pretextual reasons. Um, that actually isn't their interest. Their real interest is actually to favor a political party. Um, and I suspect that was part of the problem that you all ran into with that, that particular valley. I mean, I don't know, but that's my guess because I've seen this story before. I've seen this movie before. Yeah. Let's put it that way. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's, you know, partially why I think there is an interest not just to be you know compliant with the Voting Rights Act but also obviously I think you can guess which party that would likely lean towards as well but what's interesting I mean depending on who you talk to the maps that we currently have are not favorable to the 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 majority right now um, but it's also what's interesting is that my inbox gets flooded with people who even deny the results of this last presidential election or even the gubernatorial ele election when it's still fairly clear. So when you have this extreme partisanship, to me, it seems very, very difficult to actually have something that people can be happy with because I don't think that there's ever a situation where people will always be happy. Well, and it's, it's kind of hard to define perfection in this area. I mean, it's, it's not as if each state comes with these natural boundaries that map right onto your legislative House and Senate. But, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, don't you think this is one of the virtues of federalism? I mean, we, we had a U.S. Supreme Court decision called Rucho about three years ago. And in a really close decision, the U.S. Supreme Court said, you know, we're, this is just not for us to handle. We know it's bad. We know there's a problem, but we just don't think this is something we can do in a fair, neutral way. So they throw it back to the states. What's been happening? So you have some states like North Carolina and Pennsylvania have handled it through the courts. I mean, that's just litigation claiming their fair and equal election clauses in their state constitutions. Mm 
regulate this, and they've relied really heavily on their state courts, Pennsylvania Supreme Court, North Carolina Supreme Court. A bunch of states have done what Washington's done, come up with these compromises, commissions, where you have to get buy-in from both parties. You know, in 10, 15 years, I'd like to think there may not be a perfect winning insight, but I'll bet there will be some better insights. Yeah. And that, that is how it's supposed to work. And yeah. um, it's just a hard problem. Um, no. Here, one of the questions from the audience too, and kind of going back to the state versus federal laws, you know, is there a, is there a constant issue or persistent issue that you see uh, where there's a battle between the state and federal law uh, in terms of whatever issue that happens to be out there? Uh, you know, right now, I mean, let's go back to the pandemic. I mean, right now, we definitely have a situation where we have some states that are pushing really hard and, you know, less masking, fewer man vaccine mandates and a national government more for masking, more for vaccine mandates. So that's that's an example where there's definitely some tension. You know, you know, basically, though, um, we're a very evenly divided country. So, you know, at any given time, if you have a Republican administration in Washington, the odds are pretty high. I mean, just think during the Trump administration, the times the state of Washington on, say, immigration policy, I'm pretty confident your state took a lead in challenging some. Yeah. some Arthur executive General sued every single time in one. Yeah, well, so. That's so, Bob Ferguson. so there were several executive branch orders issued by the um, President Trump yeah. and state of Washington, I think was in the lead in quite a few of those cases dealing with immigration, challenging them. And, uh, you know, I don't know each case, but my recollection is with some success yeah. and then it flips. So then you can have a, a democratic national administration with president Biden, and you can have him promoting this or that policy, which happens to be, let's say in tension with, you know, the, the Republican perspective and you know, half the states either have a Republican AG, a Republican governor, or perhaps a Republican legislature that might oppose that. So we we actually are living in a time right now where we're always going to have. I mean, it's like friction is now baked into the system because we're so the poor divided in the like states. Yeah, and there's so, no so, there's no like a particular issue or area. I mean, it's almost every single everything. thing. Yeah. Everything that everything that's controversial remotely will probably have disagreement between the national government and a, a healthy number of states. Yeah, and that that went bad. That was true under President Obama. Under yeah. President Obama, the same thing happened. You had some states. I mean, think of the national health care law. That was a a fight where the Democrats in Washington passed the national health care law, and then you had quite a few Republican governors and Republican attorney generals you know, challenging in particular the uh, individual mandate and a little bit the uh, Medicaid expansion. So, yeah, I think that's the, that's the world we're in. I don't, I'm not sure that's, what, that's not what it looked like 70, 80 years ago for what it's worth. You think yeah. so? I mean, there are still controversial issues, but I guess you're right to ratify the, the, the constitution, have an amendment, you need three fourths of the states, right? So, I mean, slavery, right? Like suffrage. Uh, well, well, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't mean to be, yeah, I don't mean to say, um, there was never tension between the states and the national government. I guess what I mean to say is not as many points of tension. In other words, I don't think in the 1930s, groups of governors and attorney generals were getting together to oppose the presidential yeah. administration in the way that's kind of become a form of business the last 15 years, it seems. Yeah, it's more persistent in the sense that it's less about the issue or ideology so much as the party that they're going after. It's it. I worry about that, and I don't think that's consistent with federalism. Federalism is supposed to be fifty state experiment experiments, not two party experiments. It's fifty. Yeah. So that makes me a little nervous because um, you know the political parties. It's a good system, but they don't have a monopoly on virtue or correctness. No, nor nor do they have alignment within their own ranks. I'm I tend to be one of the more progressive members of our legislature, so I butt heads with folks as well. So there is not a unified monolith in terms of what is a Republican or what is a Democrat as well. So it's kind of a, a tough dynamic to be in, but kind of switching back a little bit where at, towards the end of your book, you talk more about local governments in general. So we focus largely on federal government versus the state. Um, and what's interesting is that in the U.S. Constitution, there's actually very little about 
the state and their local governments is largely left, left up to the states to decide. And, and just as an anecdote, you know, when I was first elected and I was making my rounds, talking to the mayors, talking to our city council members, almost universally, they would, the first thing they would say is, uh, we likely will oppose just about all local preemption. Don't, don't <laughs> preempt us. And then the number two thing I would hear was uh, something called unfunded mandates. Essentially, the state mandates local jurisdictions to do something, but doesn't provide the resources to actually execute. So there's always been this tension, literally from day one of me getting elected to even now about the state requires us to do this. We don't want to do this. What is that role? Um, and even in your book, you called out one of the cases that we have here locally uh, about busing. So Washington versus uh, the Seattle School District, uh, as it relates to busing, where the Seattle School District wanted to improve racial inequities in our in our education system, and then there was an initiative to try and overturn that as well. So I was more curious to see, you know, expanding from just the federal versus state versus state versus local, kind of what your thoughts are on that on that dynamic. Yeah, I, I think it's so important in America right now. So this is basically federalism within federalism, right? So just be, you know, you have the national government versus the states and get the same fight, like the national government imposes unfunded mandates on the states, or they try to preempt state laws and states don't like that. And so the same thing happens in return between states and local governments. And it's also politically fairly intense right now because we have this trend where cities tend to be getting more progressive, whereas rural areas tend to be getting a little more conservative. So you have this, and in a state where the rural area is in control of the legislature, that sets up some real opportunities for conflict between a state conservative legislature and progressive cities, which are very powerful. Like there are a lot of people there, a lot of wealth there, a lot of business there. And so plenty of room for tension. You know, my, my view is that local government actually works pretty well. Um, you know, we don't rely on courts that much for local government. We, we, we don't know that much about it. I mean, we, most people don't understand their city council, their city charter. Um, how, how all that works, magistrates at the local level. But for the most part, it seems to work pretty well. And I think it mainly works well because democracy works well. There's not really gerrymandering in local government. That's not really a thing. So you have a situation where people get to vote. They're usually willing to accept defeat when they've had a fair shot at it. And, you know, I'm, I'm actually, my, my favorite thing is localism at the city level. I wish every American would say, if I really care about something, let's fix it in the neighborhood, fix it in the city. And if that works, maybe fix it in the state. But then after that, enough with telling people how to do things. Let other people follow your example and have the courage of your convictions and let them, let them see that it's a great idea and let them do it rather than coercing them through Washington. So I'm a huge fan of local government. You're, these fights between the state legislature and cities that's a classic throughout the country. Um, yeah. You have you have this problem all the time, and it's you know home rule is often the way it's talked about, and localities understandably would like a lot of flexibility in what they do, but that can run into problems. I mean, what if it's a locality that wants to, you know, liberate you know gun regulation, and that's inconsistent with state policy? I mean, that's that's a that's not easy, right? Because state citizens are going to go to that city. They're not, they're not just by themselves. So it'll have, you know, public policy ramifications for people beyond the city. But that's, you know, it's just a good example of where you could have a, a disconnect between the city and the state legislature. Yeah, no, it's funny because you mentioned it as well. I think all politics is local and the more local, the more germane it is to your actual life. But what I found is that most often when I reach out to constituents or other residents in the community, they're more focused on the national issues and <laughs> care very little about the local. And that's such a generalization to the point where it's like, you, you, think, you realize that all the things that you care about are actually happening within your neighborhood and that you can influence it there as well. And there's a tremendous amount of power there. Well, I, I, I'm gonna turn in this around and ask you a question. I, I worry that this is partly a function of the fact that we're, we're getting our news through the internet and national news, national papers, and local news is just really taking a hit. And yeah. so if you don't have good local news, of course, your, your thinking is going to be controlled by these national debates, which, you know, 
in, in Bexley, Ohio, I'm not going to affect national debates. That's, that's a, that's not going to happen. Yeah. I, I can affect debates locally. And, but I worry a little, about our, our local news sources, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm. Oh I'm, yeah. In Seattle, we have an issue. If again, being on the more progressive side, it is viewed as being very, very biased candidly. And then even one of the local news stations just changed their branding to match their national affiliates and had an exodus of journalists who were there because of it. So it's more overt. I mean, from my perspective here, because we're seeing it as well, but the fact that you're right, that there's less of a connection locally, we have great, at least in my district, the West Seattle blog, which is fantastic. And that's a way to connect folks. But part of the identity of a community is having that news and that connection. And absent that, you do start to then gravitate towards, you know, digital media that has less due diligence when it comes to journalistic integrity. Uh, absolutely. I, yeah. So I, I, you know, I wonder a little bit if that's kind of fed this idea that it's the U.S. Supreme Court, it's the president, it's Congress where we go for everything, even though they're not really in a position to regulate a problem in Bexley, Ohio, or, you know, rural Washington. <laughs> no, no. But what's interesting is kind of going back to that local versus state what I have noticed is that oftentimes when it's a tough issue where it's like a tax vote or, you know, gun legislation or something like that, I will see oftentimes members uh, from local jurisdictions say, hey, the state needs to take this up because then I have to vote on it. And they can just say, hey, the state, the state did it, not me. So there is an interesting dynamic there. Uh, I, I've seen that many times before. I think I think sometimes legislators rely on courts. Uh, the court made us do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to, I didn't want to do this. The court made me do it. Um, but you know, the, the thing I think is the most puzzling about localism is where you have something that's, you know, really is, is unique to the state. I mean, so take, you know, apples in Washington. I mean, everybody knows that's like, how could you possibly want national regulation of apples? I mean, you know, state people in Washington understand apples better than anybody. That would be crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And yet I don't, I'm not sure that's how we think. Um, I, I think there's some things that really are handled best locally where the expertise really is. Yeah, no, I, I yeah, I agree. That and like kind of one of your, the last sections as well, and kind of you talked about in the book is that in reality, Congress can't do everything, right? Whether there's a capacity limit, whether there's prioritization, but even in Washington state, to give you an idea, we see two to 3,000 bills in any given year, two to 3,000 bills, yet we only pass about 300, right? Less than 10% of the bills we see we actually pass, and even more so at the federal level. So in reality, the states have to step in. There are just functions that cannot happen without the local jurisdictions. So in this dynamic, in this gridlock that we're seeing at the federal level, um, where over the last four years, the Senate really has only been appointing the judicial uh, members but not really doing much else, you know, what, what does the constitution, like how, what, what we need to do to ensure that the ever-changing needs and the circumstances that we're facing right now can be as dynamic as the moment warrants? Yeah, I mean, this, this actually goes back to the courts. Um, you know, I guess you won't be surprised to hear that since I'm a judge, but, you know, one of the downsides of constitutionalizing things you really care about is it's a shortcut. And the shortcut obviously has a benefit. You get something really quickly, you really like, it's for the whole country and it's constitutional, so no one can even vote on it. So that's the upside of going to the courts to get constitutional rulings. The downside is you don't do the hard grassroots work of convincing people that this is a really good idea. So what ends up happening is sometimes when you do these shortcuts, they become temporary victories because you really don't have a foundation where people have really decided this new idea is really worth accepting. It really is the right way to think about it. And so that's that's where one of my biggest convictions about this topic comes from, that we're, we're hurting ourselves and dealing with new circumstances. We're racing for a quick victory, but the victory, you know, it's either Pyrrhic or temporary or just not as fulsome as it could be because you're not doing the hard work of going to your neighbor, your community and saying, you know, I know this is how you used to think about this, but I want you to try to see this perspective. And when you do that work, then you do the change. It lasts. It becomes permanent yeah. and people don't keep fighting about it. And so to me, 
that's that's a localism point and in that and that's not that's really local like town by town yeah and, and state by state yeah you know what's interesting about that too is that we've talked a lot about the partisanship and the extreme nature of politics locally now as well but what's interesting is uh, i've tried to prioritize talking to folks that oppose my views on purpose and even when you look at washington state last year 93 percent of our bills 93 percent were in fact bipartisan so what's interesting is that oftentimes when we get into these silos, we don't consider either other states or other constitutions, or we look at just the federal level, we think that there is this division. We think that there is this tension. But when you actually sit down and have some of these conversations, you realize that you agree more often than you realize. Have you seen that happen potentially as well? Yeah, you know, I, I think uh, I see I see this, first of all, in the courts. So my court is quite diverse. Uh, we're roughly half one political party, another half the other political party, 90% of our decisions are unanimous. And so quite often the stuff we're asked to do, the way the stuff legislators are asked to do, there really is a common ground. And, you know, I suppose the news doesn't feature that. It's kind of a boring story to hear that everybody in the legislature agreed with something. It must not be very interesting, but um, yeah, so I, I, I do think the conflict and the partisanship, um, it's not overstated in some areas, but it's certainly overstated as applying everywhere. Like that, that I agree with you. And I'm not surprised to hear your, your experience. I am surprised to hear there's 2000 bills. Who could read 2000 bills? That's like oh yeah, uh, that's seven a day. I mean, <laughs> well, that's why, that's, that's, why that's, why we have committee. that's why we have committees. So that way we don't have to read all 2000, just the ones that are in your committee. Yeah, I don't think there's enough time for me to do that job. That's a lot. <laughs> no, no, not at all. But no, I, I think this is just incredibly fascinating because I think really what the takeaway that I'm having so far is that you need to have perspective. You need to be able to understand how this impacts other folks beyond just your jurisdiction. And that you'd be surprised that you could find something where people will actually agree and that then should become more of a national issue. So kind of as we're having this discussion as well, I'm just curious, what is the biggest takeaway that you want people to have from reading your book? Yeah, I, I, I think my, my a key takeaway is um, let's not fall into this trap of thinking there's only one court and one constitution to protect our liberties, protect our property, protect equality, that we really need to start thinking of our state courts and state constitutions as a way to do this. That would be thing one. Thing two is just to ask ourselves, do we really want the U.S. Supreme Court to be in charge of so many significant issues? I mean, our, you know, our, our fate is basically going to be you win half and you lose half. Um, so, you know, one day you're happy because they rule in a case you like and the next day not so much. And so I guess I'm puzzled why we embrace that so much. Um, you know, I, I've. I would think most Americans would probably take a trade where they got rid of the U.S. Supreme Court decisions they didn't care for in return for losing the ones they did care for. You, you, it'd be fair. You'd, you could vote on these things. You could seek relief in state courts. Um, so I guess the message is let's start local to begin. Let's use our state courts and state constitutions. You know, people might be surprised to hear that most cases in the court system are in the state courts. Um, you know, I think the last year for which we have numbers, the number of cases in the state courts in the year were, you know, basically close to 50 million. And the number of cases in the uh, federal courts for that year were just 400,000, 50 yeah. million, 400,000. <laughs> I mean, why are we, why are we only talking about the federal courts? I mean, the state courts have a really big role to play. And if you care about the rule of law, and justice, you ought to be thinking about at least both systems and maybe even the state court system as a priority. Yeah, yeah. Here, now I'll, I'll know that we have about 10 minutes left. There are a couple of audience questions as well um, to get your take on as well. So kind of one of the first ones is, do you foresee the U.S. ever having a sort of city-state situation as the partnership plays out? Which I think we're actually seeing right now where folks are, you, what you mentioned it, becoming more you know, liberal and more conservative and how that might play out yeah well I, I i guess i hope not i mean so you know in in history we definitely have times where we've had true city states right i mean there really have been times where the city was effectively its own state its own country um 
that would seem to me quite unlikely in our country. Uh, what I do see is um, there is more money and there is, you know, obviously population in these cities that makes them very powerful entities. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, if you were to take the top 10 cities in this country and take their wealth <laughs> and numbers, that's a big, it, these are big yeah. numbers. And um, so I suspect um, that that's important, but, you know, it's possible COVID has flipped that a little bit because COVID has led a lot of people to realize there's a lot of places you can live and work. Um, you can, you can stay in the city, but you can also be outside the city. So maybe that, that actually could be quite good for the country. Um, I, I, if I had to work, put my finger on one thing that really worries me, it's the coast. I really, yeah. I really feel like there's quite a different set of attitudes politically on the East and West coast versus kind of the flyover country where I live. And I, I think you've seen that play out. It's true within flyover country, you have cities that are, you know, very progressive and probably um, have parallel views to some of the coasts, but I probably worry about that as much as anything. And I, you know, I think that might explain the intensity in some of our elections, this, just this sense that um, particularly people in flyover country feeling aggrieved that they're not understood, um, particularly in Washington, you know, whether it's Congress, the president or the court, and, you know, that's probably not good. No. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's a good idea. Even when you have to disagree with somebody, it's a good idea to show you understand where they're coming from. And I wonder if we're maybe not doing as effective a job on that front as we could. But I guess I don't see city states in our future. Um, I, I hope not. I think that would be a, a pretty revolutionary transformation. But yeah. I do see cities exercising considerable power within state government and really a, a probably in the within the national government in some ways yeah and the idea of being understood too is kind of a fascinating one because even the microcosm that is washington state you know it's known for being blue and like the majority of us you know population wise live in king county which is the urban area but it's very different in our rural communities in central and eastern washington as well and that's kind of where that tension lies in the sense that most of the the feedback that i've heard going to legislators in other jurisdictions is that they just feel as if their issues aren't being heard. So I think that dynamic certainly kind of manifests itself across the nation as well. Have there been any examples where say Western Washington and you know Seattle area have come together on something that was controversial or is that just asking too much? Uh, I mean, so here, the, the one controversial one recently uh, in the past few years has been water rights, right? So that's kind of an afterthought for like those in urban areas, but it's uh, literally a, a life decision when you come to a rural community as well. So that was kind of one of the issues that was put in the forefront. Um, potentially issues that, you know, I think have brought people together. I'm not sure if they actually brought folks together per se, but the idea of funding for education as well, that was uh, uh, kind of put top of mind. The way that it was done, I'm not sure if that was necessarily, you know, bipartisan per se, we were divided legislature at that point. But education, I mean, that's the bulk of our funding in Washington state. So that's kind of, you know, comes up uh, from time to time. Well, that, that's a, that makes a lot of sense. In Ohio, the same thing happened. The cities and the rural areas both agreed that we needed to improve equity. So they were working together on that one. Um, yeah. Yeah. The way that it was implemented is still under debate. I think that's uh, part of the, the <laughs> issue as well. No. And then here, another question from the audience. This is more of a direct one, I guess, in terms of the Supreme Court, but, you know, Roe v. Wade, should it have been, you know, taken up initially? And do you think it'll be overturned? Um, have at it. Yeah, yeah. That Well, as a federal judge, I have to be a little careful on that. Of course, there's an argument tomorrow, um, which is on everybody's radar screen. And yeah. I, of course, have no idea. Um, and that's up to the nine justices, as opposed to an intermediate court judge like me. Um you know, I do, I do have a lot of faith in all nine of them. I mean, I think they're all patriots. They care for the country. They care for the rule of law. I think the case illustrates the difficulty of being a judge because the rule of law can mean a very different thing to two different people. I mean, they can both be equally smart, equally well-intended, each with really interesting American experiences, and yet take opposite views on that and if they took opposite views i mean the one thing to keep in mind is if they their opposite views aren't i'm for abortion or i'm against abortion their opposite views are 
is this for the court to decide or is this for the states to decide? So those are, that's not, you know, that's not how legislators work, right? A legislature, legislator would say, this is what the policy should be and I'm either for it or against it. The court is, is doing who decides. The, the court is a, is this for the US Constitution, the US Supreme Court to decide for the whole country? Is it for the states? And so that's gonna be their fight. And, and the, the question in this case, of course, is it's about a case that was decided you know, almost 50 years ago. And so that leads to another debate of you know, precedent and standing by precedent. And that's tricky because um, on the one hand, the court likes to stand by precedent, but on the other hand, this decision is still still generates controversy. What can you say? I mean, that's not a above the fold headline. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. And, no, that's uh, definitely top of mind for a lot of folks here as well. And that's kind of why this conversation is perfect. We've done a lot in Washington State to protect women's rights, but at the same time, knowing federally that can all be changed as well, I think causes a lot of pause for people. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not here to say how someone should feel one way or the other. Um, but yeah, it is true. I mean, I suspect half the states in one sense, you could argue it's irrelevant because the state legislature would provide probably more protection than the U.S. Supreme Court provides, but it doesn't mean the decision isn't a symbol for some people or that they don't care about those other states, right? I mean, there's, a, there's other states where you wouldn't have the same protection as Washington or New York um, as examples, um, but yeah, I'll be watching the case probably as uh, carefully as uh, the member of the audience. <laughs> yeah. And then kind of to wrap it up, I know we're getting close to the seven o'clock hour over, over here at least, is what do you see of the future uh, for the courts or kind of how the state versus local versus federal level can play out, obviously, given the political dynamics that are happening right now? Or what is your vision for what that could be if things go well? Yeah, I, I, I do think um, the federal courts in general are aware that um, they're just part of one system and there's these 50 other systems and all 51 ought to work together. I think that's been true and maybe has gotten a little more true. Um, I think the current U.S. Supreme Court, all nine of them, um, I think probably all nine agree that maybe their footprint on American government is bigger than anyone expected. But even if you agree on that, it doesn't tell you what to do next. Like it's, there's no like recipe for shrinking the footprint of a very important branch of government. I mean, think of yeah. abortion. Yeah. I mean, abortion, if they didn't cover it, they'd be shrinking the footprint, but that would leave half of America not happy. And so it just illustrates. And then if, you know, do gun, they had a gun case a week or two ago. What if they narrowed that? I mean, that might make some people happy, but it would leave another group quite unhappy. So it's not... It's not simple to shrink the footprint of the court, but I do think it's a court that's very tuned into the reality that there's a lot of ways to fix problems in this country. I think they're tuned into the reality. It's a big country. Um, it's gotten a little more diverse in terms of its composition, um, different parts of the country, different schools, diversity, race, faith. That's probably been good for the court um, to have more perspectives there. Um, it depends and, um, on who you ask. I think it depends on who you ask. Well, I think, I think everyone agrees the diversity is good. They might not like um, switching out one justice for another. I, yeah. you know, I have relatives that I've heard complain about that. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. So I, I understand the point. Um, in fact, you know, we Americans, we want to win. We, want, we, we know what we like and we want to get it is, is yeah. how this works. And so you can talk all you want about diversity, different parts of the country, different law schools. If someone's not for your particular view, um, you probably get a, a searching skeptical eye. Yeah, <laughs> fair <laughs> enough. Well, look, thank you so much. Uh, I've learned a lot from this conversation as well. And I appreciate you taking the time especially as a legislator who grapples with this. I think this is something that I deal with internally and with my colleagues. So having somebody literally write a book about it is incredibly fascinating. And I'm going to recommend this to everybody else as well. Well, thank you, Senator Wynn, for uh, interviewing me. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not a citizen of Washington, but when the question who decides come, I'm pretty comfortable if it's you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Senator Cho, thank you so much for leading this discussion tonight. Thank you for 
being here in Seattle at Town Hall with us. And Judge Sutton, we couldn't thank you enough for tuning in virtually. It feels like you're here. Your presence is so known. And I thank you both for all that you do for everyone ever. So thank you. <laughs> um, please remember to buy a copy of the book from our friends over at Third Place Books. And that link can be found in the chat. Thank you both so much. And for everyone at home, have a great night. Thank you.